Hello, everybody, and welcome to Iceberg to Go, your daily dose of Pittsburgh Penguins news and analysis. You can find us on YouTube at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcast from. It wasn't pretty. In fact, there was a whole lot of ugly involved in the Penguins 6-5 to victory last night over the Detroit Red Wings. A lot of hideous plays, a lot of ugly plays, a lot of poor plays, but also a lot of really stellar performances, a lot of good plays, a lot of smart plays. Fortunately for the Penguins, the good slightly outweighed the bad, and they get a pivotal victory over the Detroit Red Wings. But I think the prime example of last night's game, if you wanted to whittle it down to two players and their performance kind of telling the story of the entire game, it's Eric Carlson and Chris Letang. The Penguins, two, you could say Hall of Fame defenders. I know Chris Letang's is going to be a little bit more of a conversation, but Eric Carlson's a no-doubter. And those two were all over the map last night in good and bad ways. And I would say for those two, it was more bad than good. But at the end of the day, they got the job done. But let's go through it here because even though the Penguins come away with the victory and Penguins fans should be happy at the moment because they're in the playoffs, there's a lot of mistakes that came from last night's game that the Penguins need to eliminate in the next three to make sure they get into the playoffs. And once they do... They need to eliminate them to have any chance of getting out of the first round and trying to make a run out of this thing. Let's start with Chris Letang. He was all over the map last night, especially in the first and second periods. He settled it down a little bit in the third period, and I thought that he kind of faded into the back, which is exactly what you want when you're up two goals. You want defenders to just play their position and not make any mercurial plays, and that's what Letang did in the third period. But in the first and the second, especially in the first period, he was all over the map. Carlson, on the other hand, was sort of the inverse of that. And it's surprising because you could look online, and I said it midway through the second period, Eric Carlson was making a heck of a lot of defensive plays. He was playing responsible in his own zone. He was engaged. He was physical. He was making good stick checks. He was playing very good defensive hockey through the first two periods. But then he fell off a cliff. Inexplicably, he fell off a cliff with a 5-3 to three lead. When he'd been playing great defensively the majority of the night, he fell off a cliff defensively. It made no sense to me, but that's exactly what happened. Eric Carlson went back to being that 1% that you see on Jay Fresh hockey cards in the defensive end of the ice. So you look at these two, and you say, all right, they both scored a goal. Carlson's being one that we'll talk about in a little bit, a huge goal. But they also had a direct impact on four of the five Detroit Red Wings goals. And when I say direct impact, a lot of the times when a goal is scored in the National Hockey League, I'm not big on saying, oh, that was that player's fault. Oh, that was that player's fault. But last night, it was too obvious. You look in the first period, those two goals on Latang, both of those plays. Go to NHL.com, click the highlight, and both of those plays start with the puck being on Chris Letang's stick. He tries to make the breakout pass in both instances. It ends up being in the Detroit Red Wings possession, and then he gets made to look like a Roomba. I'd call him a pylon, but he was moving around the ice, but he was just moving in ways that weren't going to get any defensive plays done. He didn't take the pass away. He didn't take the shot away. He didn't take anything away. He looked like a Roomba, Roomba just aimlessly bouncing around the defensive zone in the first period last night. Had no idea what he was doing. And then Carlson, in the third period, it was his time to shine in a negative way. The last two Detroit goals, Eric Carlson, I don't know what he was doing. It looked like his controller died, to be completely honest with you. On the fourth goal, Eric Carlson inexplicably follows a player behind the net because Marcus Pedersen had him marked. Marcus Pedersen was going to take that guy out of the play, and all Carlson had to do was shut down the pass or cover the guy that is in the slot wide open. What doesn't he do? He doesn't do, he doesn't block the pass. He doesn't take away the guy in the slot. Instead, he just slowly follows the play behind the net, leaving the net front wide open. Now, would you like to see Alex Nadelkovich make a save on one of these opportunities, one of these goals? Yeah, he made a couple of timely saves last night, but at the end of the day, when your defense hangs you out the dry, the way that Carlson and Latang did, it gets a little bit harder. Now, again, five goals, you can't 
completely wipe the slate clean for Alex Nedeljkovic. But you look at the play of these two guys in particular, Eric Carlson and Chris Letang, at certain instances in this game, and you just say, what is happening? Not to mention, you know, I almost forgot the last goal for the Detroit Red Wings, the tying goal. Eric Carlson is pinching with a one-goal advantage in the last 10 minutes of a must-win game with no support behind him. Leads to a two-on-one. Pedersen tries to take the pass away, tries to take the guy out of the play. It turns into a goal, turns into a tie game. And all of a sudden you're looking at that as the Penguins were up two goals. And at that moment, the Islanders were tied. The Capitals were losing and everything was going in the Penguins favor. They give up those two goals and you just look at it and you say, wow, did they really squander their best opportunity to get into a playoff spot? But in peak fashion, both of these players redeemed themselves to a certain extent at points throughout the game. Chris Letang scores in the first period on a breakaway goal, a nice job to jump into the rush and a nice play by both Ricard Raquel and Michael Bunting to get it to him. He scores a massive goal for the Penguins, putting him up two to one at the time. And then there's the Eric Carlson goal. Eric Carlson in overtime, a frame that has been notoriously difficult for the Penguins to get any job, any work done. He steps into a shot and absolutely lasers it past Alex Lyon, scores a massive goal, creates one of the best images of the season and definitely scores what, as of now, will stand as the biggest goal of the season for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Now, of these two defensemen, I would say Carlson had the better game. He made the bigger mistakes, but he had the better game in total. But at the end of the day, the Penguins need more from both of these guys. Not more in a sense of offense. I think both both of them obviously contributed a goal last night in pivotal moments in a pivotal game, and that's great. But you can't have your controller die. You can't have your mind go out to lunch in the middle of these games, especially in crunch time like it did with Carlson. And he said after the game, he said, boy, I needed that one. Well, we needed that one, but I needed that one. And it's true because he at that point had felt that he let the team down to get it to the point where it was a tie game. He comes back, he scores a huge goal. Not only is it a game-winning goal, not only is it a goal in game 999 for Eric Carlson, but it's a big goal for Sidney Crosby. And that's how I want to finish this episode. I want to look through a couple news and notes because it was a newsy Thursday night for the Pittsburgh Penguins organization. And let's start with Sidney Crosby because I can't go this entire episode without giving Sidney Crosby his flowers because he is a masterclass at work and he showed it once again against the Detroit Red Wings. Another ho-hum milestone night. Three points, one goal, two assists, and that passes Phil Esposito for 10th all-time in NHL scoring. That's a crazy thing. I think that's something that has kind of been overlooked based on how big the game was, and obviously Sidney Crosby after the game is only interested in talking about the big win and getting back into the playoffs and the team accolades. But top 10 all-time in scoring is a big milestone. So congratulations to Sidney Crosby. Does it in only Sidney Crosby fashion, making sure that he gets, one, a beautiful play on the first goal, banking the pass behind the net to himself, setting up an assist for the opening goal of the game. That's a very Sidney Crosby-esque play. Two, driving the net and deflecting the puck in on a beautiful pass from Brian Rust. And three, setting up a game winner that, as somebody tagged me on Twitter, said was eerily reminiscent of the Chris Kunitz overtime goal, double overtime goal in 2017. Yeah, the fact that it's a fluttering puck, the fact that it was a knuckle puck, and the fact that it was a huge goal at PPG Paints Arena in a similar area, 100%. But not only that, he notches his one thousandth assist. There are players that would be happy to get to 1,000 games played just playing in those games. Crosby has 1,000 assists now in his NHL career, the 14th player in NHL history to do so. And behind all of this, all these career accolades, this big win, you look at what Crosby's done over the last 15 games, get the Penguins to this point. It's nothing short of phenomenal. 25 points, nine goals, 16 assists in his last 15 games. I know the Hart Trophy is going to be tough to get into the conversation this year when you have Nathan McKinnon, Connor McDavid, Nikita Kucherov, all upwards of, what, 130, 140 points fighting out for the Art Ross. You have Austin Matthews, who's knocking on 70's door. So I get it. It's going to be tough for Sidney Crosby to get a lot of love in the Hart Trophy race. But damn if he isn't making it interesting. 
He's probably not going to finish anywhere close to the top of that, but I'm sure he steals a couple votes in the Hart Trophy race. A crazy season for Sidney Crosby, a masterclass at work, and he continues to just will the Penguins forward in their quest for a playoff spot this season. Also want to mention Jeff Carter. I don't have a graphic for Jeff Carter because I forgot to, and that might be the reason that I'm talking about him. His goal might get lost in the shuffle, but that is a huge goal for the Penguins. And I said it on Wednesday's episode of Iceberg to Go. If you listen to it, you knew exactly what I'm talking about. I said at some point in these last four games, the Penguins are going to need somebody in their bottom six to step up and score a huge goal. Reminiscent of 2015, whenever Brandon Sutter had to score two goals in the season finale to push the Penguins into the playoffs, Jeff Carter scored a similar type goal, a similar timed goal on Thursday night. Huge shorthanded tally that at that point should have been the dagger. If not for, as we go back to the beginning of this episode, if not for Eric Carlson just mentally turning his controller off, that should have been the dagger and the Detroit Red Wings hopes last night. It wasn't. They came back. It turned into an entirely different story with Eric Carlson walking away with that huge goal and that huge moment. But Jeff Carter deserves some flowers for that because that was a stellar play, heads up play, a veteran play, and a play in which I saw a lot of people say online last night looked like the post trade deadline Jeff Carter, that post trade back in 2021 Jeff Carter, who scored, I think it was nine goals in or seven goals in nine games or nine goals in 13 games or whatever it was. The Jeff Carter that scored four goals against the Buffalo Sabres in 2021. That's what he looked like last night. And that was a huge goal for Carter, for the Penguins. And it does not need to go or it should not go unrecognized. And that's why I wanted to bring it up. Another little piece of news and notes before we talk about the playoff picture, where the Penguins stand, how important that win was last night, and how they stand and fare as far as tiebreakers. I do want to mention a couple Penguins prospects who had a couple of big things happen to him yesterday. Tristan Bros, let's start with him. University of Denver, he is the second round pick of the Penguins back in 2021. He scores an overtime game winner for the University of Denver to send him to the national championship. His second overtime goal of the NCAA tournament, huge for him. He has 40 points in 42 games this season, not under contract with the Penguins, but under control with the Penguins as he was their second round pick, like I mentioned. So interesting to see after this season, how the Penguins address Tristan Bros. He started at the University of Minnesota. He went to this tournament, didn't fare too well in his his freshman season now in his junior season I believe he goes out there and scores a massive goal to knock out Boston University and prospected number one overall pick Macklin Celebrini and that crazy team of Terriers so a huge night for Tristan Bros, Penguins prospect and also a nice day for Taylor Gauthier goaltender of the Wheeling Nailers named to the all ECHL first team Gauthier has a 24-16-2 record with the Wheeling Nailers this season, a 9.23 save percentage, 2.23 goals against average, and four shutouts. I'm not saying anything about Taylor Gauthier being the next big goaltender for the Penguins because he's doing this in the ECHL. But being one of the best goalies in the ECHL just adds him to the long list of Penguins goaltending prospects that are starting to impress and starting to take their name to the next level and be the strength of the Penguins organization. Penguins have a really good goaltender in Gautier in the ECHL. They have a really good young goaltender in Yoel Blomqvist at the AHL level. He's tearing it up. They're going to the playoffs. And let's not forget about Sergei Muraschev over in Russia, who's having a really, really stellar season, making it three really, really good prospects for the Penguins at the goaltending position. So good night for bros. Good night for Taylor Gautier and, also, might as well give out a shout out to the first round pick from last year, Braden Yeager, as the Moose Jaw Warriors advance to the second round of the WHL playoffs, which I believe begins this weekend. So keep an eye on the Moose Jaw Warriors and Braden Yeager, who had a couple of big goals for them in round number one. Let's talk before we go about the playoffs. Playoffs? Yeah, the playoffs. We're in the last week of the NHL regular season. It's hectic. It's close. It's going to come down to the wire. You look at where the Penguins stand. As of right now, they sit in a playoff position for just the second time since November 14th. The first time was last weekend when they won over the Tampa Bay Lightning. That was taken away from them on Sunday, the following day, when the Detroit Red Wings won and kicked them right back out. But as of right now, they sit 
in a playoff position, that second wild card spot with three games remaining. The Penguins currently have a one point lead on Washington, Detroit, and Philadelphia. They are three points behind the New York Islanders for Metro third with a massive matchup with them coming up next Wednesday. If they can pull one more point closer, that matchup could potentially be for that Metropolitan third place position. And you look at the tiebreakers and that's what's going to get interesting here, especially with three teams tied at, I believe, 83 points. The Penguins right ahead of them at 84 points and the New York Islanders at 87 points. The Penguins have clinched the tiebreaker, which is regulation wins over the New York Islanders. So they have a tiebreaker over the Islanders. They're up two regulation wins on the Washington Capitals with three games to go. They've clinched with last night. They clinched the regulation wins tiebreaker over the Detroit Red Wings. And they're up two regulation wins on Philadelphia with two games remaining in the Flyers schedule. Everybody else has three. So. For the Flyers, the Penguins either need to win one more in regulation to take that tiebreaker, or the Flyers just simply need to either win in overtime or lose in general one of those two games, and the Penguins get the tiebreakers. And I know that's not the end-all be-all. At the end of the day, standings points is much more important. But with four teams separated by one point, these tiebreakers might come in handy. And the Penguins have it clinched over two of those teams. They're very close to having it clinched over the Philadelphia Flyers and they have an advantage over the Washington Capitals. That's a good spot to be in, especially with the three games that the Penguins have left being three very difficult games. But then again, same could be said for the Washington Capitals. They have the Tampa Bay Lightning and the Boston Bruins over the weekend. The Penguins have the Boston Bruins and then the Nashville Predators. All of these teams are playing in pretty big games over the next couple of days to determine who gets into the Stanley Cup playoffs. Penguins right now sitting in pole position which as I said last night, it's always better when it's a close race like this to be looking from the inside out than the other way around. Penguins, they have the fate of the season back in their hands. We'll see what they end up doing with it. They had it last year in a similar situation. We'll see if they can get the job done in 2024. But that's going to do it for this episode of Iceberg to Go. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. It's been a hectic week. It's been a wild week. And it's only going to get crazier as the regular season comes to an end. But you can find us on YouTube at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcast from. We'll see you next time.